The Mojo Radio Show. We scour the planet to find the biggest names in health, creativity, wellness, strategy, brand, performance, management, and more. Turn this up. This is going to be crazy. This is Jason Overcome Redman. Hey, I'm Dave Acosta. Hi, this is Cal Newport, author of Deep Work. G'day, this is Ryan Park. I'm Batman. This is Ivan Davies from South. I'm Andrea Burke from the Canadian National Women's Rugby Team. I'm Lucas Fickendee. This is Kate Fletcher, Kate Spider. This is the Mojo Radio Show, or I'll be coming to see you. Then we ask them the big questions. Oh, man, this is such a great question. You've actually landed right on the mark. That's a, another really good question. It's great talking to some clever dudes, frankly. I've gone probably a little bit more in-depth with you than, uh, than I have in the book. I've done, like, 500 interviews, but nobody asked me about this. <laughs> oh, wow. And sometimes we talk about darts. There we go. Can I tell you, Dina, Gary's favourite sport is darts. How athletic is that? I think it's uh, interesting that it's your favourite, but I won't be judgmental. <laughs> yeah. Look, it's the only sport that I know of where a prerequisite is a pint of beer and a cigarette. Come on, let's be honest. The Mojo Radio Show. We don't take ourselves too seriously. So you try throwing a half a dozen darts in a row and just see how you go, uh, my friend. Okay. But we hope you will. Welcome. I got my boat. To the Mojo Radio Show. But it just won't work on you. Hey everybody and welcome to the Mojo Radio Show. Lots going on. A lot of us still in lockdown, at least for the minute. Well, actually, that depends on which political leader you listen to, but opinions are wide and varied by territory. But nevertheless, we are still here in lockdown. Good to have you on board. If you're new to the show, and I suspect there are a few new listeners every week, uh, especially after Derek Sivers published our show on his show, Uh, and some other exciting things happening for us around the globe. If you are new on the bus, what's the show about? Well, we just find interesting people. Today's no exception. We speak to them at their own point of view, try and get their opinion on something that they're doing really well that we can apply to our own world to get our mojo working, or maybe for someone else who's struggling at this time to get their mojo working. Last week, we headed to Bucket List Town, this week, we're heading to Bucket of Ice Cream Town. So before we start, a uh, quick whip around the studio before we start, uh, as they say in the ice cream business. AP, if you were to pick your favourite flavour of ice cream, okay, what would you say? Favourite ice cream flavour is uh, mm, cabbage, I think. Cabbage, Brussels sprout, always nice. Rum and raisin. I don't know if this is appropriate. Lola, if you were to go with your favourite ice cream, I don't know, in your world, do you have ice cream? I'm not a big fan of ice cream but I do like a good fish and chips. Robbo, you look like you know your way around a bucket of ice cream. Uh, if you were to pick your favourite flavour, where would you go? Do you know what? I'm actually not a huge ice cream fan. I'm not a big sweet fan at all, but I, I am kind of fond of, we, um, we have a home ice cream churn and a passion fruit vine out the back, and I love uh, the frozen passion fruit yoghurt that the kids and I make, which is awesome. Hmm. What's the difference between a gelato and an ice cream. Uh, the spelling? No. But I think it's something to do with the creaminess of the ice cream. I actually don't know. I've always wondered. I always feel better eating gelato than I do ice cream. I'm not an ice cream guy, but I love a good gelato from a really authentic gelateria. <laughs> That'll uh, do. But I, I think it's got something to do with the amount of cream in it. I should ask Jenny that question. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. There we go. Interesting so one. There you go. But now it's not a yogurt. The yogurt's a separate. That's a separate gig. Yeah, frozen yogurt. Yeah. Robbo's remarkable facts. It's about time. Let's go. Comfort food. Would yours be gelato for a comfort food? Yeah. What's your comfort food? <laughs> no. What would you? What's your go-to when you're feeling a bit blue? Oh, the only thing I really eat is seventy percent dark chocolate. Okay. Well, there you go. Cacao dark chocolate's the only. That's the only real thing. I mean. If I was going for a real comfort food, I would say going to a great chocolatier mm-hmm. where you pay way too much money <laughs> for, for, for a, a piece of chocolate. S- 70% dark chocolate because yeah. it's actually good for yeah. you. It's one of the few things that are, but that's a bit of a stretch really. Nice. Isn't it? Well, a recent study set out to discover what sort of events compel everyday people like you and me to eat comfort food for solace. The study was completed in 2015 by Dr. Jordan, and uh, apologies if I get this wrong, but I'll do my best, Troisi found that securely attached individuals ate more comfort food in response to naturally occurring feelings of isolation than any other emotion. Sound familiar at the moment? 
an unexpected result of the study also concluded that some healthy foods actually provide comfort by decreasing stress and anxiety. These feel-good foods included avocado, almonds, turkey, blueberries, asparagus, yogurt, kale, and salmon. So next time you're dressed up in your Sunday best at the supermarket doing the rounds, perhaps you might want to stock up on a few kilos of those to substitute for the leftover Easter eggs we've all been binging on, no doubt. Blueberries? Salmon? What else are we putting in our shopping list? Oh, hang on. There was, uh, so it was uh, feel-good foods include avocado, almonds, turkey, blueberries, asparagus, yogurt, kale, and salmon. So pretty good for you regardless so whether it works a big or not. Deal. It's Why, good for you. That's right. Why wouldn't you have that in your shopping trolley anyway? But here's an interesting thing though. I, I don't know if you do the household shopping, but Tanae and I take turns once a week. And the thing that amazes me, and in fact, we may have talked about this on the show, stop me if we have, but you walk into the supermarket and the fresh fruit aisle, the vegetables and the fruit and all that stuff is fully stocked. But you go, you walk past the aisles where the two minute noodles are and the, you know, the breakfast cereals and all that sort of stuff. And they're the the shelves that are almost empty. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe there is another message in that as well. AP, what are your thoughts, mate? Um, well, I'm just curious. What was that list of food again? There was uh, avocado, almonds, turkey, blueberries, asparagus, yogurt, kale, and salmon. The Mojo Radio Show. Our guest this week is Jenny Britton Bauer. Now, if you are one of our friends in the States, in America right now, and you probably will know that name because Jenny is the person who started and is running an American ice cream maker uh, called Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams. Jenny, Actually, it's funny, as you'll hear during the show, Jenny is actually a pioneer in the artisan ice cream movement. And she introduced a a very modern ingredient-driven style of ice cream that's now being copied and duplicated by a lot of other ice cream makers around the world, which goes to show that that's an innovation in itself. And what we're going to do is just talk to Jenny because this, this is a fascinating story. This is a very big company in the States. We're going to get behind the curtain to the how how did Jenny do it? She opened the first store in 1996 and she also is the CCO, which is Chief Creative Officer. Jenny really has built this brand and is the beating heart of the company and in charge of all the creative output from the ice cream itself and the packaging, the, the beautiful photography, everything, the people, the, the values, the culture, everything that goes on. Jenny's doing it. And she's also a 2017 Henry Crown Fellow. It's been recognized by Fast Company as one of the most creative people in business today. And she makes ice cream. Excellent. Jenny, welcome to the show. It's such a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. When people ask you what you do, so particularly people outside of the United States of America, if they ask you what you do, how do you like to reply? Depends on who I'm talking to. And that's the sort of nature of being a founder of a company. Um, Often I to call myself an ice cream maker, even though, you know, the job and the role is so much bigger than that. Um, But yeah, I sometimes just say founder. I'm a founder of an ice cream company. And then the rest is uh, the next question. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's interesting, Jenny. As soon as I told the guys we were interviewing somebody from an ice cream company, I've never seen everybody turn up the studio early for a show before. So I think uh, that in itself has been a good start. But this is not just an ice cream company. Just tell us about the scale. How, how many stores, 
how much ice cream do you dish out each day or each week? Like, just give us an idea of the scale of Jenny's splendid ice creams. Well, we're considered a mid-sized country or co- company in America, um, which blows my mind because I still feel like a small company, even though we're not. I mean, we um, we have forty-five stores. They are slammed. They are lying around the block um, during peak hours every week. Um, shops and really busy all the time. Um, of course, now we're closed because of um, um, the, the pandemic, um, but we're still doing lots and lots of delivery. In fact, an incredible amount of delivery. We've always had a website, or at least since 2004, um, and that has been going, it's up actually almost a thousand percent since this pandemic hit, which is sort of crazy, but it's always been a pretty big part of uh, what we do. And then we have a grocery uh, channel as well. So we're in three, 4,000 grocery stores across America now. Uh, mostly they're the sort of upscale um, sort of maybe natural food stores and or mom and pop sort of gourmet groceries and and a couple of conventional as well. Yeah, and it's, it's – it, it'll just take an off-ramp here because this is – the fact that you were geared up to do delivery, that in itself was innovation for you guys because there was a time in your story where there was an opportunity to deliver, but there was a, there was the common way of delivering, but you weren't satisfied with that. You wanted to find a better way to deliver. And it's funny how years later that turns out to be such an important element in this pandemic because you're up now 1,000 odd percent. Tell us about that period and how you pivoted on the delivery of Jenny's. Well, actually, you know, we were, it was kind of funny because we're in the middle of Ohio, kind of in the middle of the country, in the middle of the middle of the country. And um, so we couldn't get attention from some of the big media companies on the coasts. And in the beginning, you know, I thought we were doing something really remarkable, which is to make ice cream as a fellowship or as a as a group of makers and growers and producers, people who are actually growing or making the ingredients for us. Um, it was a be- it's a beautiful sort of ice cream based on these people, and I wanted to get some attention from that media. and um, And I realized that I needed to be, you needed to be able to buy our ice cream in New York City in order to get uh, attention from New York City media, and so that was why we opened our website. Um, And then we started getting uh, tons of media attention all over the country Um, for years. It was, I mean, we still do, but it's, it was just, it was just so much. And then that then fueled the growth of our website, which then in turn fueled the growth of our shops because we could then open in cities where we had a, a fan base already. And so it was really a way for a small company in the middle of the middle of nowhere, almost to get recognition and to serve because everything we do is from the point of view of service, almost serve our community, but make it bigger. What did you do though that made made that happen? There, there must be, uh, I heard you talk about the fact that you did something specifically with you wouldn't accept the way ice cream is typically being delivered. You had to find a different way. What was that innovation? Well, gosh, I'm trying to figure out what you think. I mean, definitely we 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 worked on our shipping box. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> The, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the way that it's delivered. So um, instead of just sort of throwing pints into a, um, you know, a box and delivering it, we actually designed a really beautiful box. I mean, I, I wanted it to be um, a really beautiful gift. And so, and, and also we want to transport you as closely as we can to get you into our world or, you know, we can't get you into a store, but we can get you into this world. And so when you open the box, first of all, the box is bright orange. Um, and then when you open it, you sort of unfold, this sort of experience unfolds. I mean, you just, you know, it's, um, you get like a sort of, um, I guess like a, it's, we, it's actually almost looks like an album cover when you open the box and you get to this thing and then you get little sort of materials and then you hit the pint. So you kind of almost learn about the pints and what's inside the box as you un. Uh, box it. And by the time you get to the pints, you really want to take a bite, but you can't because it's under dry ice. You have to actually wait a couple of hours while it comes to temperature, but it's a beautiful experience. And I think that's part of that. And it's all part of your, which I'm going to, I just want to dig into your view on how you do things, Jenny, because you've got this different approach to everything you do, which is an amalgamation of things, which I want to endeavor to pull apart. But the the delivery situation, you just said, we can't get you into our stores, but we can get you into our world. You've, You've always had this personality that has never put limits on yourself. And 
I'm just wondering, I've heard you talk about that a lot. I'm just wondering how long have you been conscious of this? Like when you think back, where did that come from? Because most of us don't follow that philosophy. Most of us will, if we were starting a company, go with what's common for delivery. But you've you've always been one to never have limits. Where does that come from? Well, I think you're right. And I think that's true about everything we do. You could you could unpack in that way. I would say that this comes from growing up in the middle of the middle of nowhere. I've mentioned that a couple of times, but I mean, I really do. I think I spend so much time now and over the last, let's say, decade in um, Los Angeles, in New York, in all of the big cities in America, because we have ice cream shops there and all over America. Um, and the one thing that I've noticed about those communities is incredibly inspiring as they are is that they also put a lot, there's a lot of rules in those communities, even in the creative communities Mm. or so-called creative communities in that. And there's a lot of pressure to be successful. Whereas I got to work out whatever I wanted. I got to imagine whoever I wanted to become. I, I actually tried when I was in the early days, I was trying to make ice cream that lived up to, because I couldn't travel. I didn't have the money to travel. So I was just trying to live live up to what my imagination was of what the greatest ice cream in the world might be. But I think that when your imagination is there, but you're not really feeling that, that pressure from people, I look back and I think that that was actually the best thing that could happen to me is to have this space to create without that pressure of being in the big city and or the pressure of graduating from a prestigious business school or you know, things like that. But just that that sort of belief that I, I had no reason to think that I couldn't do it. <laughs> and I think that sometimes you get that when you're in, um, when you're in certain situations, you have this, you know, people show you why you won't succeed versus helping you just do it at all costs. But, you know, I think about it a lot because I don't think that our business plan, you know, if we, if I took my business plan and went to say a pitch competition somewhere, I think they would just laugh me out of the out of the room because our, our ice cream company, the way that we do everything doesn't make sense on paper. It evolved slowly based on this two way conversation between me and our customers and our team. And, uh, and it became this sort of crazy, wonderful company, but that is our opportunity in the world. You've used the word unmanageable when you talk about yourself. You've actually said that growing up, going through this, this early in your career and in the business, you've been unmanageable. Just tell me about that. What What is the psyche of someone who's unmanageable? Is that a positive thing? Well, it is for me, um, but <laughs> <sighs> yeah, you know, it's funny because I really am and I've known this about myself forever. I mean, I for a long time, I have always thought of myself and I've been told that I'm a nice person. So I don't have a problem with kindness or love or giving or wanting to be a part of my community. But what I have a problem with is authority and for people, people who want me to do something. Um, And so (laughs) even if it's for my own benefit, you know, as soon as someone tells me to do something, I have zero interest in doing it. And as a matter of fact, I will show you the other way to do it. It's just something that I think I was actually born with. It's it's a it's a weird thing. I don't want to say that I'm a compulsive contrarian because I'm definitely a team player, but um, but I don't like authority. I like freedom very very much. It's probably my number one value in the world is is freedom, which is why I'm an entrepreneur. I think if you were managing you and you knew that you were unmanageable, how would you manage you? I would fire me. There's no way. I could never work with me. <laughs> <laughs> you would not, I would not last on my own team. There can only be one of me uh, on this team. And I would be very, it, it's, I can be a very annoying person, I think. <laughs> no, I think, it's, I think it's okay on our team. I mean, I definitely like, I'm not a micromanager kind of person uh, because I understand me. And I understand that I need to learn on my own in my own way. I also understand that that's how other people need. Everyone needs that space to take a risk, make mistakes, grow from it. And so, um, so, you know, maybe I would have been a decent boss for myself because I definitely want people finding, I, I'm not a, my, you know, I'm not a person who gets in it and tells people how to do it. I want you to figure it out and just be awesome in your own way. And that's what I call, you know, it's fellowship. It's literally, I mean, I, I always say my favorite business book, people ask me sometimes what my favorite business book is. And I always say it's the Lord of the Rings movies. But I mean, I really do think that like fellowship where you bring your awesomeness in 
and everybody does that. And that makes this fellowship that's greater than the sum of its parts. That's like what building our company is or any company. And so, um, so I might've been able to give myself the freedom to try and fail and try and fail, which is what I, what I would need to be able to be on someone else's team. I think. Is that part of the values, Jenny, within the company? Would, would your team, if I talk to them, would they all believe in their own heart that they had the flexibility, they had the space, they were being encouraged to try things, to risk things, to have a go at things? Would Is that something that is embedded into, because you've got thousands of staff, is that embedded into the team? Absolutely. Um, I think if anyone, you know, heard me saying this, they would absolutely support, you know, back it up. Um uh, we like, I think we fall back on values. Those are the things that can't change. You know, these values of community that we have and quality and creativity. Um, and, and really it starts with people and, um, and, and sort of, um, the, you know, wanting to be this true sort of diverse fellowship. But other than that, all ideas we want them all out and on the table. And so, um, that's, I th- that's really, I think a strength of our company. If I take you back, there was a, a time in your own mind where everything clicked for you and you knew that you were essentially going to challenge the game of ice cream in America. And Yeah, you, but you, you want to know when that was? That was <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was in um it was a it was in 1996 and I was still studying art. And it was the first time I really was awakened to ice cream. I had worked, I loved ice cream growing up and I had worked in an ice cream shop. I always knew I would. There was something about ice cream that I loved. But what I didn't realize is that it was all about scent. And I had been so interested in, in pastry. I was thinking about being a pastry chef and I was really interested in scent and how scent is part of food, especially pastry because they're like vanilla is a scent and you know chocolate is a scent and coffee and peppermint and lots of different herbs, but ice cream is this perfect platform for scent. And once I realized that, and it was in my own kitchen in 1996, my next thing was I telescoped it into the future, which is what vision is. And I saw a different ice cream world in America. I saw that like, as much as I adore Ben and Jerry's and haagen and some of the other players, they weren't doing what I was doing. And I thought I can make ice cream new and, and kind of exciting again. And uh, of course, I didn't realize how long it would take, how much money it would take, how many people and brains it would take. You know, I thought I could do it, you know, pretty quickly, but I didn't know anything. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, it was always, it was always about farms and people and telling stories because I came from that art world. And um, so anyway, so it had to be slow, I think. Why did you not tell anyone? I've heard you say that you had this and you, you do talk about this very strong visionary ability you have, but at the same time you said, just now you said, I could clearly see it, like I knew what I wanted to do, but you didn't tell anybody. Was that an important part of it for you? Yeah, sometimes I do tell people what I'm going to do. Because, and in fact, when I tell people, I tell everyone because I feel like it puts me on the hook for actually doing it. But then sometimes, and quite often, I just keep it to myself. I always, I'm a very vision led person, but I sort of feel like it, it gets jinxed a little bit if, um, if I tell too many people or if I tell anyone. Also, I think because really, I think if I were being honest with myself, I think I would say I'm a woman from the Midwest in America, I have these values that are, that require me to sort of stay quiet, hard work, you know, don't get too big for yourself. And sometimes my visions be like, like are bigger than, than that. You know what I mean? And so I'm almost like embarrassed to say that to people like, no, I'm planning on, you know, doing this. Um, so I think sometimes it just is me holding myself back because I don't want to tell anybody because people might think like, first of all, you'll never do that, which is fine because I know I will. Um, but but also like, isn't it a little too big for, you know, the sort of little Jenny from Ohio? You know what I mean? Um, so I sometimes just keep it to myself. <laughs> we've, uh, over the, we've done seven seasons and over the, the years, I've picked up on a lot of people who have a preferred way of learning or creating, which is using the senses. And quite often people are very visual. We've had people like Derek Sivers who are very, very awed, David Heinle Hansen, very auditory. It was about sound and narration. And and yet I've never had anybody with as such a strong olfactory or sense of smell that you have. 
when tell me about the moment where you with this first click for you because i i actually find this fascinating for leaders to understand how they learn or process information the best and i've never had anybody with this such a strong olfactory take me back to the moment where you discovered that in yourself and it became conscious um gosh i mean i when i was a kid i grew up going to a forest that my grandparents owned you know we had 10 acres but in a bigger forest it was an old growth original growth forest and so we were out there every saturday and so through the seasons there were different scents in the woods and i and i remember just being so connected to that um but what happens as you get older and wiser and you have many more experiences um you know, in your brain and your emotions, and you have that sort of patterns that you can create in life because you're older now, is that um, sense will take you back so, so clearly to a specific moment in your time. And really it's about how you felt. And so I think as entrepreneurs and as founders, and I think it probably is true in music and other senses as well, it always goes back to emotion. And so however you get there is, is, is the probably the important thing for me that's scent definitely um and uh, and some visual as well but i mean it definitely it starts with scent and then i i can connect into that sort of memory bank through scent so clearly and so easily and then i from there i can take it and i can write about it i can communicate about it i can inspire people through that i mean it's um it's because i know how to do it because i know how i felt and somehow scent does that for me i can connect with with um, feeling and emotion that way. So you grew up, spent a lot of time in the forest. In fact, there were times where you'd be left alone in the forest for a couple of hours and you could smell well, the forest to. floor. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I hated foraging. it. My grandparent mother would make me do it. <laughs> but it's a great and memory That's where now. I want to go to with this, Jenny. I, 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 a couple of things with this. Number one is if you close your eyes, think about your grandmother, what flavour, scent or fragrance is your grandmother? Well, my grandmother with the forest, um, I'm really thinking here. I, For some reason, I'm thinking tall grasses, but it's definitely an outside um, sun hitting grass is what I would say for her. Mm-hmm. And then the other grandmother Your- is very opposite. She would be the sort of inside warmth, um, smokiness, sugar cooking kind of thing. When you talk about your granddad, you always follow your granddad with Thoreau. When you close your eyes and think about a flavor, scent, or fragrance for your granddad, what would that be? Oh, you know that scent um, when um, it's almost like the match, like a match scent, but it's like a very sweet smoke scent. It's almost like the first puff of a camel cigarette. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because he did smoke camels, but they didn't smell good. There was only one puff that smelled so beautiful. It was almost like a, I don't know how to describe it, but it was um, almost like a match scent. Mm. If I could make ice cream out of that scent, I would. And it's funny because it's not that pleasant because obviously cigarettes or whatever, but like it, there's one moment when that was in it. Yeah, I, I would definitely, for, for, for that grandfather, I would go with that. He was an amazing man, very quiet, but very strong. If you were to close your eyes and think about the word love, or maybe picture even your wedding day, what fragrance, flavor, or smell is love? Oh my goodness. I, somehow or another, I'm going with, um, I'm going with meringue. Um, There's just something really beautiful about that that I am linking into right now, and I'm not even sure I can describe, but there's something that it's, um, it's airy and very sweet and um, kind of fleeting a little bit as well, but always beautiful. See, I find this fascinating. And I think the takeout for all of us is that we are, not all of us have this strong olfactory. Some people have a very strong sense of taste, they're gustatory, visuals, auditory. Some people are very touchy feely, need to process, but rarely do we think about the sense that is so strong for us in terms of how we process information and then how that can unfold in our careers or our lives. And I just wanted to do that to illustrate how powerful this this is for you. But then when you discovered ice cream, it all made sense for you, didn't it? Yeah, it really, it really did. And that was why, um, you know, I was doing scent. I was thinking about scent. I was thinking about how to incorporate it into my art 
Um, and that once I started making, and then I was making pastries. And so once I started making ice cream, that was, that sort of became that. Um, but when I, when I tell young people, like how to do what I did, it's all about doing what you want, what feels good. So I was really studying everything I wanted to study, um, art, pastry, scent, and then, um, and even art history and, you know, classics and things like that. And all of that, the crossroads of all of that is ice cream. And so if you're open to this idea of like, how can what I do affect the world, then you're, then you're doing entrepreneurship thinking, you know, so I love BMX biking and being outside. Well, how can I turn that into something that I can sell or, you know, some way of making the world better. And I like doing that. And I like telling kids this because it isn't just like the next great business idea, because that isn't enough to keep you in it. It is so hard to do this. It is a life. It's not, it's not about money, you know, oddly, um, that you really need that otherworldly passion. And so that's where it's like, do the things that you are inspired to do. And through that, you will find what you need to do. There was a time where you changed what you wore and you started wearing kind of a white scientist outfit. And I heard you even refer to yourself as a scientist. Is that kind of an identity you have adopted, Jenny? Is that something in the, it, as like an almost an alter ego, a part, a part of your identity is that you are a scientist who experiments? Is that a conscious thing for you or is that something that just is just a natural part of how you do things? I realized um, I always I did my best my entire life to stay away from science and math because partly it was people in my um, life who, when I was young, told me I wasn't very good at that, so I should just stick with art and English and literature. And so I did. Um, and I got into ice cream making, and I realized it's all science, that if I want to do the ice creams the way that I want to do them, and tell the stories that I want to tell, I have to learn how to do that. And that's all science, math problem. It's science, it's chemistry. And I had never taken any of that. I mean, I, I had never even passed a math class in high school. I had to take summer school to get through it. And so I had to have that sort of reckoning with the other side of my brain. And when I did, I realized I'm actually really good at this. And that my grandmother, in fact, my grandmother, the, uh, the art teacher, um, she was also a scientist. In fact, she was a scientist first. She did, I mean, I realized this later, that she did probably a year's worth of research often before she even started an art, a new art project. And so once I realized, wow, first of all, we've gotten it all wrong. There's not like right brain and left brain thinking. We're all whole brain thinkers. We just have to exercise. Some of us have to exercise more on the other side a little bit. We should push ourselves to do that. Um, we just have to find the right way in. So it's very much um, something that I have taken on because I have to sort of in a way balance that out in my life and help kids understand too that like you're good at, you know, let's use our whole brains. You're already good at it. You're already doing it. You may not think that you're a scientist, but you are because you're looking at the world and you're thinking and you're looking for patterns just like scientists already do. It's funny, since we've started talking, you've mentioned a bunch of different things that you've either done or tried. You mentioned art, you mentioned drawing. We've talked about perfumes and olfactory. You've talked about early on in your career, the, your interest in baking. You've mentioned literature, history, the impact of your granddad. We've now talked about science. You're even into sky fi. And then even when you talk about being at the markets, when you first started the business, you talked about how much you learned about wine and cheese. It almost seems like you've been a generalist in order to become a specialist. Would you agree with that? Oh, I very much would. Yeah. Yeah. And I think in an era where everybody's really specializing, um, it's sort of, I've, I see how it's unique because I, I sometimes feel like I wish there were more people doing that. I feel like every time you meet somebody, they're just like, they, 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 they've gone so deep on one thing. And, um, and I think that we lose perspective doing that. And I think that we, we need to get a little more of that sort of back, I think. You've used the term being an ice cream Jedi. <laughs> Who, what <laughs> ma- tell, me, tell me the identity of an ice cream Jedi. What, what makes an ice cream Jedi? What does an ice cream Jedi do? Just de- de- describe one for me. 
Well, I think that Jedi's in general get past um, that you you get past the daily uh, drills. Let's say so you're you know you're you know you've got your lightsaber and you're doing the drills that your coach has told you to do. You get past those and you get into a place where you're operating on instinct. And so I think that that's where I'm at. It's not just making the ice cream and the and the because that is a specific thing uh, process of doing that. It's what are people looking for? What um, what are the preferences of our customers? How can we describe things to customers in a way that they'll that will inspire people. Um, how do you um, take, how do, you know, I, I meet so many people and sometimes in one night I'll meet a thousand people when we do a store opening. So how do you take your emotions and alter them every 30 seconds to two minutes to a different person and, me- and mind meld with them a little bit or energy meld with them? And there's, so it's a whole bunch of things that that sort of make up what my role is. And it is on that sort of almost autopilot at this point. Not that I don't think about it. I'm trying to get better all the time, but it's, it, you're operating on instinct and then reflection and then instinct and reflection versus doing the daily drills of trying to learn. Does that make sense? I think it's gold. I think people don't really think about that in terms of how they could create some sort of identity because that's, that's really actually quite profound that you are meeting so many people and yet you might meet them for 90 seconds, yet that person felt as though you were completely, and something I, I think I've heard people like talk about Tom Hanks the same way that when you're with Tom Hanks, he makes you feel like, or The Rock, that you are the most important person in the world, which they walk away having had a moment, but it's just one of a thousand people you meet on the night. But that really it's it's such a skill, isn't it? Such a beautiful skill, yet in your mind, it's something that can be learned. Yeah, and the way that you do it is um, um, you put yourself aside. It, it, it's odd, too, because I think that I, I, th- I bet you, I, I think that The Rock and Joe Biden, who's also very good at this, and, you know, um, who all of everyone, I think that we would all say that we benefit from it more than anyone else because you, you're putting your self and your ego and your pains and your other things aside for other people. And there is something just really cleansing, really beautiful about that. And you truly care. The only way you can actually do this, the only way you can build the stamina to do it is to actually care. You know, there's no faking it, but you can train yourself to really, truly care. I think there was, it's funny with these shows, Jenny, that you talk to people who have been super successful, yet there's always been a, a speed bump. There's always been an off ramp, something where things went pear shaped. And I don't really want to spend a lot of time on the actual speed bump. Uh, but there was a time where Jenny's went through the battle with Listeria. There are lots of stories out there about it. It was a huge disruption to the company, cost millions of dollars, recalled many hundred thousands of pounds of ice cream. What I want to know is, which I think is such an interesting learning is, you said that during that period, you said to yourself, I'm never going to be as creative as I'm about to be. Take us to that moment because that's quite an uncommon default for someone who's in dire distress. Take me to that moment where you had that conversation with yourself to face up as an entrepreneur to what could have been a business ending dilemma. Yeah, well, it's your do or die moment and you have to engage every tool, every skill, all of your talent, all of your gifts and face into it. Um, and hopefully if you get to this point, if you get to a, a, you know, a true crisis, and I think that, you know, if you're lucky enough to be in business long enough, most companies will end up in some kind of crisis. And in fact, I've read a lot about sometimes it's the thing that actually ends up making you as a company. And I would credit that actually is one of our reasons for uh, ultimate success as well. But if you get to that point, you know, that's the thing and sort of lean into it, look at it. And then, you know, you might only have that one chance to, to do it. And uh, so you get really focused and it's pretty cool. It was the most painful thing I've ever been through. It's long lasting. It's very difficult, but also the the thing that really made me, I think, as a human being, and for sure made our company. And we got to test our values. 
you know, we, we always, you know, patted ourselves on the back because we thought we had these incredible values. But when push came to shove and we almost lost everything, in fact, we did lose everything and then we built it back up. We, we held true to those values when we when we didn't have to we could have had an easier time if we didn't but we did we held true to them and um came out the other side okay and it's i think to that to the credit of us and our that value system that we survived it's a good test right now too because you mentioned earlier in the show the whole pandemic situation we're facing globally and that has been a true test of leadership and a true test of values. It, are you in some way feeling more prepared for it today, Jenny, because of what you went through some time back? Do you feel in your own heart that we've kind of got this? The, the, the people know we've tested our values, they're real, and that has helped you through this very challenging period? I do feel that, um, you know, of course, the difference is we're all in this, and there's something about that that's that's on on one hand, extraordinarily scary, even more scary. On the other hand, it's um, comforting to know that, well, we're all in this, so we all will will be a part of the solution and we can envision um, what we all look like on the other side. Because a vision is very important when you're just in life, but, a, but in crisis as well, so we can create that beacon of hope that we're all marching toward. Um, but I'm definitely feeling much more prepared as a company, as a human, to deal with it having been through it before. And, um, and I think that for listeners, we are in crisis. We definitely are. And we're in crisis as a globe and as our, you know, local communities and as our companies and families. Um, but the good news is we get to decide what we get to, what we want to be on the other side. And, um, and then, and then also, you know, we fall back on our values. We fall back on a community, on community and on people and, and we just get to work. In, You've said that in a true crisis, you can't see colour and you can't taste flavour. That gets to a point where it really starts to affect your senses. When you think about that period, Jenny, which is obviously super testing for you, the team, the culture, when you get home at night and your husband, Charlie, is there, he was there through this whole thing. And quite often relationships are tested during these periods. What was the greatest, best, most profound thing that Charlie did during this period that helped you through it? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I think uh, support, you know, being a good listener. And, um, and I think that, you know, he and I are so different that it's, it was good for me to get the, the perspective. He's just much more... Um, I don't know, optimistic. I think I'm an optimistic person too, but we're just optimistic in different ways. And so he was very hopeful when I would become sort of, when I would fall into despair, he would be hopeful. And, um, you know, so it was almost like um, just a good balance. But I think that just, um, that just sort of support, support meaning I'll, 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 I'll pick up where you can't right now. I will you know, lift our family up when you can't right now. Um, you know, understanding that I was, you know, I think I, I think I didn't go outside for eight weeks. I mean, I went from my garage to our garage at work and back. Um, mm. so, so he really picked up we're in our family and, uh, and then also me, for me personally. And that was so important. It's, if we go back to your values and the line you used about the whole Listeria thing tested, your values, tested the company values. And I've heard you talk glowingly about the people who work with you, who I'm sure absolutely adore you and the company, the brand you've created. You use the term earning your teammates. What's that mean? And how do we go about earning teammates? Just explain that for me. When I was young, I um, uh, it was something that I had to learn. Um, I you know, thought I had a really good idea. And, um, you know, nobody really came out for it. My first business, I've had two ice cream businesses. My first business was called Scream and I was in business for four years and nobody really came out for it. And I closed that one, sort of put some thought into it, realized that I would kind of gotten it wrong, that I was still thinking like an artist and that I wasn't thinking like an entrepreneur. I was thinking like maybe people were going to want to come in and see all the ice cream flavors that I made or whatever, instead of me thinking about what do I want to do? And also what do people want? And so once I started thinking that way, it also opened up this thinking of, 
how can I, uh, I've earned now customers. That's really great. How do I earn the next people on the team, the next things that I need? And it's really evolved because once I, because, you know, you keep going fast forward a few years as a founder, as an entrepreneur, your, your role really changes yearly. The way that you support your company is the way that I'm supporting the company now is very different from what I did last year, which was very different from the year before. And so you're constantly on your toes if you want to be a, an, an active founder. And, um, and so I think um, I do, I want to be a part of the company and I want to be a valuable part of the company and a valued part of the company and the company being people that work at Jenny's and that team. And so I think a lot about how can I earn my space, not just earn the people on our team, because I've done that now, but how do I earn my space at the leadership table? What does that role look like? And that means I have to ask people. That means I have to try things. I have to show up prepared, having done my homework, not just show up as the founder with, with you know some ideas, but show up with the right ideas. And that means learning and knowing what those are. So really thinking of myself as a part of the team, not just as this sort of person at the top or a founder or someone that people need to treat like a queen, because I, ne- I never liked that, but earning that. And then also it's really important because people will treat you like you're like this special person in the company. Um, and so I've had to be very clear, otherwise you don't get good information, that that I want honesty and truthfulness and real you know, challenge. I want you to challenge me when you don't believe in what I'm saying. Um, and I think through that, um, and maybe it's like a sort of humble way to do it, but um, to to earn that. So I think people want me on the team. And I think that that's the greatest honor for me to to still be a value. You've talked about that you're not one of these be in the moment people. You said you're either in the future <laughs> vision, which you mentioned earlier in the show that you are a visionary thinker. You could see quite clearly where you wanted to go to what needed to be done. But you said you're either future vision or you're in the past. When you actually think, look about the past, what are you actually seeing? Like what what's in the past that is value for you? Well, two ways to, to answer that. One is um, I do, I, uh, I'm, a, I, I, I'm a person who will sort of act and then reflect. So I like to build upon my own experience. So I don't spend a ton of time in my own past, but maybe in the recent past looking at that. But when I think about the past, I, I'm really thinking about myself being in, in deep history as a tourist. I'm not um, trying to memorize dates or anything like that, but, but literally go, I want to go back in time and feel emotionally like I'm time traveling. And that is just a an exercise almost, it's almost the way I meditate. I want to feel like I have friends in history, dead friends, you know, like it's part of the thing that I do. And, and weird, it also in doing that helps me relate to people who are, you know, on earth now. And, um, you know, it's just, it's part of the fun I have. I, you could call it a hobby. (laughs) Fascinating. You, when you first started, it was, you would, you were trying to look, What's what's not been done in ice cream? What's missing in ice cream? What's the missing piece of the puzzle in ice cream that the other big corporate giants weren't doing? Which which part of the ice cream puzzle are you still trying to work out? What what part of the puzzle right now still challenges you? Um, well, quite a lot actually. Um, so I think a lot about what can ice cream be now that it wasn't before, that it couldn't be before. And so when you look at uh, and, and there really hasn't been a reason to innovate in ice cream recently. Um, so nobody has until we came along, but, or really innovate. Um, but when we look back at the last century, let's say mid-century, or even like the whole ice cream, sort of industrial ice cream, um, you know, the last hundred years, the whole movement, we really are looking at like, um, how do we, how does ice cream survive the the distribution sort of, channels, right? So how does it get, and then, and then even if it does, even if you can get it to your home freezer, most of the time throughout history, you've had terrible, um, freezers at home. And so they would melt and refreeze throughout the last hundred years, let's say. And and now we're in a place where most people have really good home freezers. And so we can solve that problem. We don't have to use, so what they would do in the, in the mid century, last century would be a lot of stabilizers and gums and other things that would help stabilize the ice cream so that it could melt and refreeze. Um, 
in a, in a, and not lose much quality. And I ask, because that sort of dulls flavor a little bit in ice cream. And so I ask, can we do something different now that, you know, because we have better freezers, because we have better transportation, because we can, um, we just changed it. We do production and, and distribute it very quickly now, whereas we couldn't before. And so ice cream doesn't have to last two years. So what can we do now that's in service of flavor and how it melts that's different from how we did it before? And those still puzzle me today. I mean, I would say that our, our recipe, the way that we do it, it changes. It tweaks every year forward. But it's still almost an experiment. I mean, it's still very much an experiment because we don't use stabilizers. We don't even use egg yolks. We use, we work with milk proteins and milk proteins can act like, uh, sort of like egg yolks and they emulsify and create texture in the ice cream. But you just have to know how to do it. And then of course you have to start with really fresh dairy, which is not hard to, not easy to find. And, and so it's quite a lot to do it uh, and to pull it off. And so we're, I mean, I'm still asking the question, can we do it? even though obviously we are doing it. <laughs> Do you know when you, if, if I spoke to most people, I think Jenny and talked about being an ice cream Jedi or being an ice cream scientist, we automatically fall back to flavors, innovating flavors. And that's kind of in my mind, the general punter on the street would go to innovation, mad scientist, putting this flavor with that flavor to create something unique, which is part of it. The other part, which I found really interesting is that for you, it's innovating, not just the product and the flavors, but also who's supplying and where that supplier sources their product from or their backstory. And that's not what you'd expect from a typical or common ice cream company. So the innovation runs through all all of that's critically important for you, isn't it? And I guess that ties back to what you were saying at the head of the show, which is about the fellowship. It goes a lot further than just a flavor for you, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And um, and even though I had this vision that we could be a, a pretty big company, or I, I guess I wasn't thinking about size, but that we could be a nationwide company, it was never um, at the expense of being a good company. And by good, I mean a company that I wanted to work for. Um, but the funny, the way that I describe it to people is that I created a company that anyone would create if you were 12 years old and you just did it the way you thought everyone did it. Right. So in a way, I just started doing what I thought everyone was doing. And then I realized that's not at all how it's done. And then we figured it out. You know, we figured out how to do it. It was the company I wanted to work for. And that's, um, it's kind of become our superhero power because it is the company that a lot of people want to work for. And when you think about things like earning your team, part of it is that as well. I mean, we can't, we're not paying the same as some of the other big businesses in our city, but we have talent that rivals theirs because. We have uh, a job and there for them that feels meaningful. It feels like it's a real, like it's like you're doing good work every day and challenging work, but it's for this really great um, effort that we're all putting in or whatever. So yeah, it's um, yeah. Uh, I'll just, I'm very conscious of your time, so I'm going to wrap up. But I just a couple of things, couple of quick things. Uh, you talked about history, and that's been a thread through the show, and. I know that you believe that everything on earth has a history associated to it. With that being so, what flavor do you associate with the history of Jenny? Oh, gosh, so many. Uh, (laughs) Maybe brown butter almond brittle. Um, That one was um, inspired by Roald Dahl and his favorite flavor growing up, and he wrote about it. And so I read it and then I, through his writing, his description created a flavor based on that. And I've always said that I go, I went to the Roald Dahl school of entrepreneurship that, um, (laughs) you know, it's just, um, very different. So I think that, um, I think that that flavor probably was the, is, is the best one to describe me. Isn't it great though, when you have a backstory to a flavor, to me, it just matched so much more so-called richness to... (laughs) authenticity to something when you know there's a backstory. Well, you know, I, I, I heard, and I, I 100% believe this. I read a book about it actually, that pleasure is derived from what you believe about something. And so if someone gives you a glass of wine and they're a high level sommelier and they tell you, you know, all of the wonderful things you'll taste in it, you'll, you'll, fi- you'll taste all of that. You'll love the wine. And then you might find out if you take the, you know, what your blinders off that it's a cheap glass of wine. You know, I mean, it, it, you, 
you, your perception of the world is really based on what you believe. And so it's really interesting for us. And that's really so much a part of our service at the counter, just to give you a little tidbit about the vanilla that we're using or the, whatever it is, because it slows you down just a little bit to find that and to experience it. And then that extends your memory of it. And it's a really all a part of this sort of how we serve people. Jenny, I could talk to you for hours about this. I find your story, what you've done, absolutely fascinating. You mentioned your grandmother and you talk about your grandmother a lot who was an art teacher. Just very quickly, one final thing. When you think about your grandmother, what was the greatest lesson she taught you that you'd live by today? Go your own way. I mean, she said it over and over again. They both did, my grandfather and her, and um, and she believed it. She really, really believed it. Go your own way, do your own thing. Just make discoveries for yourself. Don't take anything at face value. Discover it for yourself. Try it. And uh, And that's hard to do because everybody wants to really, they want to protect you and keep you safe. They don't want you to make mistakes, but you know, so everybody in your life will say, you can't do that, but you have to find out for yourself because then, uh, then, then half the time the the other people are wrong anyway. (laughs) So yeah. What a great, great way to wrap up, Jenny. For those people, the packaging of your product, how you put it together, your website is absolutely beautiful, which I suspect comes from the history you have, the interest you have in art, your grandmother of influence. It's, it's, it really is something. It's, it's just a great lesson in putting an idea to practice and then iterating as you go. For people to find out for themselves, see your stuff, where's the hub for Jenny's? It's jennies.com. It's J-E-N-I-S.com. And you can see all of our story and flavors and what we've got going on right now. And, uh, and even see how we're reacting to the, the, the crisis and the pandemic at this moment. Uh, mm. Speaking of which, before we let you go, uh, our booth, <laughs> booth voiceover guy, AP, <laughs> has been drooling for the entire hour that we've been chatting. Um, he's just slipped me a note under the door and asked if he could have 12 litres of rum and raisin go easy on the ice cream and the raisins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. I wish I could get you ice cream. Yeah, well, hey. That's just, you know. Man. (laughs) Um, AP, he's on the floor, but anyway, he'll be okay. (laughs) Well, you know, I will say right now on my, um, at uh, Jenny, I'm Jenny Britton Bauer on Instagram, but I'm putting up videos of my recipes so you can make them at home. I've got an ice cream maker. I'll give that a crack. Yes. And um, my method is different, but it works. It's very, the end result is very close to what I can create in my professional kitchens and with all of the amazing ingredients that I have. So yeah, so you can actually make it. Well, I have to give that a crack. I've, I, I've got five kids and, um, oh, yeah. I, and I love to cook. And my favorite ice cream I make for the kids is passion fruit. In fact, when I make it with five kids, I rarely get any. So um, maybe I'll have to give one oh, of yours a goodness. crack and, and, see, and see what happens. It could be the, the Jenny so Robbo well, challenge. Stick some rum in, they'll sleep like a baby. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Jenny, this has been just terrific. Uh, I came into contact through a mutual friend of ours, Ryan Hawke, and I loved you on his show and interviewed you in front of a live audience. This has been splendid. I've got loads more stuff that I could talk to you about because I find your story, what you do, absolutely fascinating. You're definitely at the top of your game. Thank you so much for sharing. It was such a delight. Well, thank you so much. Please stay in touch and, uh, yeah, take care of yourself and your family. I'm Anna Devenna. I'm also known as the Sleep Muse. I help people get a great night's sleep. And often when people are struggling with sleep, I suggest that they listen to the Mojo radio show. And when they do, they fall asleep instantly. <laughs> Pop quiz, hot shot. Go. Do you know why it's called an ice cream sundae? Nah, I mean, I could, I could fake my way through it. It's got to be something to do with the days of the week, surely. There, there is, but there's actually a little bit of ingenuity behind it as well. Back in the 1950s in the United States, in a little town called Evanston in Wyoming, they made it illegal to sell ice cream sodas on a Sunday because it offended so many churchgoers. So to get around the new laws... Shop owners invented the ice cream sundae. They replaced the soda with syrup, 
to get around the soda law and then replaced the Y in Sunday with an E so they could avoid offending the religious leaders, which is pretty clever, I thought. Gee, that's a remarkable fact. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> isn't, it isn't it typical, though? Everyone's looking for an angle. Yeah. Everybody's looking for a workaround. Uh-huh. And it's no different what's going on right now globally with this pandemic. Everyone's looking for an angle and a workaround. That's right. That's Absolutely, gold. yeah. Sunday. The Mojo Radio Show. Well, it's been a great show. I think it's a pretty easy close, pretty easy play out song this week. Do you recall when I asked Jenny the lesson, the great lesson that her grandmother taught her when she was a little girl? Do you recall what it was? I uh, can't remember word for word, but it was something about going your own way. Was Produced and recorded in the basement of Voodoo Sound. For more tips and tools to get your mojo working, check us out on Facebook at The Mojo Radio Show or online at themojoradioshow.com. To help us get better and give more people the opportunity to touch up their mojo, you can now find us on Patreon. Follow the links on the front page of our website and for a coffee or two a month, you'll get regular bonus material and a copy of Explosive Hits 19, the best of the Mojo Radio Show. In the meantime... 
To polish your next audio production, check out voodoosound.com.au. For more about Gary, see garybirtwhistle.com. And to book me, go to andrewpeters.com. Andrew Peters speaking. See you next time. <laughs>